Hi friends, today we're continuing to read The One and Only Ivan. Make sure you have your book. I believe we stopped on page 10, so now we're on The Littlest Big Top on Earth. And we are reading page 45, which for you guys means we're stopping at the end of the chapter that is called Julia. And um, we're stopping before we get to drawing Bob. So once we get to drawing Bob, that's where we're gonna stop. My neighbors here at the Big Top Mall know many tricks. They are an educated lot, more accomplished than I am. One of my neighbors plays baseball, although she is a chicken. Another drives a fire truck, although he is a rabbit. So I'm guessing his neighbors are other animals. I used to have a neighbor, a sleek and thoughtful seal who could balance a ball on her nose from dawn till dusk. Her voice was like a throaty bark of a dog chained outside on a cold night. Children wished on pennies and tossed them into her plastic pool. They glowed on the bottom like flat copper stones. <coughs> the seal was hungry one day, or bored, perhaps, so she ate 100 pennies. Mac said she'd be fine. Mac was mistaken, or he was mistaken. Mac calls our show the littlest big top on earth. Every day, two, four, and seven humans fan themselves, drink sodas, and applaud. Baby's a whale. Mac, dressed like a clown, pedals on a tiny bike. A dog named Snickers rides on Stella's back. Stella sits on a stool. And if you remember, Stella is the elephant. It is a very sturdy stool. I don't do any tricks. Mac said it's enough for me to be me. Stella told me that some circuses move from town to town. They have humans who dangle on ropes, twining, twining from the tops of tents. They have grumbling lions and gleam with gleaming teeth and a snaking line of elephants, each clutching the limp tail in front of her. So again, this is great writing because it gives me a picture in my mind of what it would look like. The elephants look far off in the distance so they won't see the humans who want them, want to see them. Our circus doesn't migrate. We sit where we are like an old beast too tired to push on. After our show, humans forage through the stores. The stores where humans buy things they need to survive. At the Big Top Mall, some stores sell new things like balloons and t-shirts and caps to cover the gleaming heads of the humans. Some stores sell old things, that, things that smell dusty and damp and long forgotten. All day, I watch humans scurry from store to store. They pass their green paper, dry as old leaves and smelling of a thousand hands back and forth and back again. They hunt frantically, stalking, pushing, grumbling. Then they leave, clutching, clutching bags filled with things, bright things, soft things, big things. But no matter how full the bags are, they always come back for more. Humans are clever indeed. They spin pink clouds that you can eat. They build domains with flat waterfalls. They are lousy hunters. Gone. Some animals live privately, unwatched but that is not my life. My life is flashing lights and pointing fingers and uninvited, un uninvited visitors. Inches away, humans flatten their little hands against the walls of the glass that separates us. The glass says that you are this and we are that, and that is how it will always be. Humans leave their fingerprints behind, sticky with candy, slick with sweat. Each night, a weary man comes to wipe them away. Sometimes I press my nose against the glass. My nose print, like your fingerprint is the first and last and only one. The man wipes the glass, and then I'm gone. Artists, here's my domain. I do not have much to do. You can only throw so many knee balls at humans before you get bored. A knee ball is made by rolling up dung until it's the size of a small apple and letting it dry. I always keep a few on hand. Kind of gross, Ivan, to be throwing poop balls but I kind of see he seems to be bored. For some reason, my visitors never seem to carry any. Yeah, I don't think humans like to touch poop. In my domain, I have a tire swing, a baseball, a tiny plastic pool filled with dirty water, and even an old TV. I have a stuffed gorilla, toy gorilla too. Julia, the daughter of the weary man who cleans the mall each night, gave it to me. The gorilla has empty eyes and floppy limbs, but I sleep with it every night. I call it not Tag. Tag was my twin sister's name. Oh, so he misses his sister. That's why he named the little elephant not Tag. 
Julia is 10 years old. She has hair like black glass and a wide half moon smile. She and I have a lot in common. We are both great apes and we are both artists. It was Julia who gave me my first crayon, a stubby blue one, slipped through the broken spot in my glass along with a folded piece of paper. I knew what to do with it. I'd watch Julia draw. When I dragged the crayon across the paper, it left a trail in its wake like a slithering blue snake. Julia's drawings are wild with color and movement. She draws things that aren't real, clouds that smile and cars that swim. She draws until her crayons break and her paper rips. Her pictures are like pieces of a dream. I can't draw dreamy pictures, never remember my dreams. Although sometimes, I, although I sometimes awaken with my fists clenched and my heart hammering. My drawings seem pale and timid next to Julia's. She draws the ideas in her head. I draw the things in my cage, simple items that fill my days, an apple core, a banana peel, a candy wrapper. I often eat my subjects before I draw them. But even though I draw the same things over and over again, I never get bored with my art. When I'm drawing, that's all I think about. I don't think about where I am, about yesterday or tomorrow. I just move my crayons across the paper. Humans don't always seem to recognize what I've drawn. They squint, cock their heads, murmur, I'll draw a banana, a perfectly lovely banana, and they'll say, it's a yellow airplane, or it's a duck without wings. That's all right. I'm not drawing for them. I'm drawing for me. Max soon realized that people will pay for a picture made by a gorilla, even if they don't know what it is. Now I draw every day. My work sells for $20 a piece, 25 with a frame, at the gift shop near my domain. If I get tired or need a break, I eat my crayons. Shapes in the clouds, hold on. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. So here's our drawing. I think I've always been an artist. Even as a baby, still clinging to my mother, I had an artist's eye. I saw shapes in the clouds and sculptures in the tumbled stones at the bottom of the stream. I grabbed at colors, the crimson flower just out of reach, the ebony bird streaking past. I don't remember about much in my early life, but I do remember this. Whenever I got a chance, I would dip my fingers into cool mud and use my mother's back for a canvas. She was a patient soul, my mother. Imagination. Someday, I hope I can draw the way Julia draws, imagining the worlds that don't exist yet or that don't yet exist. I know what most humans think. They think gorillas don't have imaginations. They think we don't remember our past or ponder our futures. Come to think of it, I suppose they have a point. Mostly, I think about what is, not what could be. I've learned not to get my hopes up. We're on the chapter called The Loneliest Gorilla in the World. Oh, so we were right. He is feeling lonely. When the top, Big Top Mall was first built, it smelled of new paint and fresh hay, and humans came to visit from morning till night. They drifted past my domain like logs on a lazy river. Lately, a day might go by without a single visitor. Max says he's worried. He says, I'm not cute anymore. He says, Ivan, you've lost your magic, old guy. You used to be a hit. It's true that some of my visitors don't linger the way they used to. They stare through the glass. They cluck their tongues while they frown while I watch TV. He looks slowly, they say. Not long ago, a little boy stood before my glass, tears streaming down his smooth red cheeks. He must be the loneliest gorilla in the world, he said, clutching his mother's hand. At times like that, I wish humans could understand me the way I can understand them. It's not so bad, I wanted to tell the little boy. With enough time, you can get used to almost anything. TV. My visitors are often surprised when they see the TV Mac put in my domain. They seem to find it odd, the sight of a gorilla staring at tiny humans in a box. Sometimes I wonder though, isn't the way they stare at me sitting in my tiny box just as strange? My TV is old, it doesn't always work, and sometimes the days will go by before anyone remembers to turn it on. I'll watch anything, but I'm particularly fond of cartoons with their bright jungle colors. I especially enjoy it when someone slips on a banana peel. Bob, my dog friend, loves TV almost as much as I do. He prefers to watch the professional bowling and cat food commercials. Bob and I have seen many romance movies too. In romance, there's much hugging and sometimes the face and sometimes face looking. I've yet to see a single romance starring a gorilla. We also enjoy old Western movies. In a Western, someone always says, this town ain't big enough for the both of us, Sheriff. 
In a Western, you can tell who the good guys are and who the bad guys are, and the good guys always win. Bob says Westerns are nothing like real life. The Nature Show. I have been in my domain for 9,855 days, alone. For a while, when I was young and foolish, I thought I was the last gorilla on earth. I tried not to dwell on it. Still, it's hard to stay upbeat when you think there are no more of you. Then one night, after I watched a movie about men in black hats with guns and a feeble-minded horses, a different show came on. It was not a cartoon, not a romance, not a Western. I saw a lush forest. I heard birds murmuring, the grass moved, the trees rustled, then I saw him. He was a bit threadbare and scrawny and not as good looking as I am, to be honest. But sure enough, he was a gorilla. As suddenly as he'd appeared, the gorilla vanished and in his place was a scruffy white animal called, I learned, a polar bear. And then a chubby water creature named a manatee. And then another animal. And another. All night I sat wondering about the gorilla. I'd glimpse. Where did he live? Would he ever come to visit? If, he, if there was a he somewhere, could there be a she as well? Or was it just the two of us in all the world trapped in our own separate boxes? Stella. Stella says she is sure I will see another real live gorilla one day. And I believe her because she is even older than I am. She has eyes like black stars and knows more than I will ever know. Stella is a mountain. Next to her, I'm a rock. And Bob is a grain of sand because, as you know, gorillas are smaller than elephants. Every night when the store closes and the moon washes the world with milky light, Stella and I talk. We don't have much in common, but we have enough. We are huge and alone, and we both love yogurt raisins. Sometimes Stella tells of her childhood, of leafy canopies hidden by mist and the busy songs of flowing water. Unlike me, she recalls every detail of her past. Stella loves the moon with its untroubled smile. I love the feel of the sun on my belly. She says, it's, it is quite a belly, my friend. And I say, thank you, so is yours. We talk, but not much. Elephants like gorillas do not waste words. Stella used to perform in a large and famous circus. She still does some of those tricks for a show. During one stunt, Stella Lily stands on her hind legs while Snickers jumps on her head. It's hard to stand on your hind legs when you weigh more than 40 men. If you are a circus elephant and you stand on your hind legs while a dog jumps on your head, you get a treat. If you do not, the claw stick comes swinging. Oh, she gets hurt. Elephants hide as thick as bark on an ancient tree, but a claw stick can pierce it like a leaf. Once Stella saw a trainer hit a bull elephant with a claw stick. A bull is like a silverback. Noble, contained, calm, like a cobra is calm. And when the claw stick caught the bull's flesh, he tossed the trainer into the air with his tusk. The man flew, Stella said, like an ugly bird, but she never saw the bull again. So probably got put down. Stella's trunk. Stella's trunk is a miracle. She can pick up a single peanut with elegant precision, tickle a passing mouse, tap the shoulder of a dozing keeper. Her trunk is remarkable, but it still can't unlatch the door of her tumble-down domain. Circling Stella's legs are long-ago scars from the chain she wore in her youth. Her bracelets, she calls them. When she worked at the famous circus, Stella had to balance on a pedestal for her most difficult trick. One day, she fell off on her, and injured her foot. When she became lame, <clears throat> when she went lame and lagged behind the other elephants, the circus sold her to Mac. Stella's foot never healed completely. She limps when she walks and sometimes her foot gets infected when she stands in one place for too long. Oh, so sad. Last winter, Stella's foot swelled to twice its normal size. She had a fever and she lay on the damp cold floor of her domain for five days. They were very long days. Even now, I'm not sure she's completely better. She never complains though, so it's hard to tell. At the Big Top Mall, no one bothers with the iron shackles. Bristly rope tied to the bolt in the floor is all that's required. They think I'm too old to cause trouble, Stella says. Old age, she says, is a powerful disguise. So she's saying, I'm still strong, even though I'm old. A plan. 
It's been two days since anyone's come to visit. Mac is in a bad mood. He says we are losing money hand over fist. He says he's going to sell the whole lot of us. When Thelma, a blue and yellow macaw, demands, kiss me, big boy, for the third time in 10 minutes, Mac throws a soda can at her. Thelma's wings are clipped so that she can't fly, Oof, but she can hop. She leaps to the side, aside, just in the nick of time. Pucker up, she says with a shrill whistle. <whistles> Max stomps to his office and slams the door shut. I wonder if the, the, my visitors have grown tired of me. Maybe I will learn a trick or two. It will help. Humans do seem to enjoy watching me eat. Luckily, I am always hungry. I'm a gifted eater. A silverback must eat 45 pounds of food a day if he wants to stay a silverback. 45 pounds of fruit and leaves and seeds and stems and bark and vines and rotten wood. Also, I do enjoy the occasional insect. I'm going to try to eat more. Maybe we will get more visitors. Tomorrow, I will eat 50 pounds of food, maybe even 55. That should make Mac happy. Bob. Explain to Bob. I explained my plan to Bob. Ivan, he says, trust me on this one. The problem is not your appetite. He hops onto my chest and licks my chin, checking for leftovers. Bob is a stray, which means he does not have a permanent address. He is so speedy, so wily that the mall workers gave long ago gave up trying to catch him. Bob can sneak into cracks and crevices like a tracked rat. He lives off the ends of hot dogs he pulls from the trash. For dessert, he laps up spilled lemonade and splattered ice cream cones. I've tried to share my food with Bob, but he's a picky eater and says he prefers to hunt for himself. Bob is tiny, wiry, and fast like a barking squirrel. He's nut-colored and big-eared. His tail moves like the wind, spiraling and dancing. Bob's tail makes me dizzy and confused. It has meanings within meanings, like human words. I am sad, it says. I am happy, it says. Beware, I may be tiny, but my teeth are sharp. Gorillas don't have use for a tail. Our feelings are uncomplicated. Our rumps are unadorned. That means they don't have tails. There's nothing there. Bob used to have three brothers and two sisters. Human tossed them into a truck onto the highway when they were weeks old. Bob rolled into a ditch. Oh, the others did not. And here's our picture of Bob so we can see what kind of dog he is. The first night on the highway, Bob slept in the icy mud of the ditch. When he woke, he was so cold that his legs would not bend for an hour. The next night, Bob slept under some dirty hay near the big top mall garbage bins. The following night, Bob found a spot in the corner of my domain where the glass was broken. I dreamed that I'd eaten a furry donut. When I woke in the dark, I discovered a tiny puppy snoring softly on, snoring on top of my belly. It has been so long since I'd felt the comfort of another's warmth that I wasn't sure what to do. Not that I hadn't had any visitors. Mac had been in my domain, of course, and many other keepers. I'd share... I'd seen my share of rats zip past in the occasional wayward sparrow and had fluttered in through a hole in my ceiling. But they never stayed long. I didn't move all night for fear of waking Bob. Well, he's being careful because he cares about him. So sad. Some people are not sunny weather people. Some people are mean and they do things like throw away animals, which isn't very nice. Wild. Once I asked Bob why he didn't want a home, Humans, I'd noticed, seemed to be irrationally fond of dogs, and I could see why a puppy would be easier to cuddle than, say, a gorilla. Everywhere is my home, Bob answered. I am a wild beast, my friend, untamed and undaunted. I told Bob he could work in the shows like Snickers, the poodle who rides Stella. Bob said Snickers sleeps on pink pillows in Mac's office. He said she eats foul-smelling meat from a can. He made a face, his lips curled, revealing tiny needles of feet, teeth. Poodles, he said, are parasites, meaning they will live off of another thing. Picasso. Mac gives me fresh crayon, a yellow one, and 10 pieces of paper. Time to earn your piece. Keep Picasso, he mutters. I wonder who Picasso is, so he doesn't know Picasso is an artist. Does he have a tire swing like me? Does he ever eat his crayons? I know I've lost my magic, so I try my very best. I clutch the crayon and think. I scan my domain. Domain. What is yellow? A banana? I draw a banana. The paper tears, but only a little. I lean back and Mac picks up the drawing. Another day, another scribble, he says. One down, nine to go. What else is yellow? I wonder. 
scanning my domain. I draw another banana and then I draw eight more. Three visitors. Three visitors are here, a woman, a boy, a girl. I strut across my domain for them. I dangle my tire swing. I eat three banana peels in a row. The boy spits at my window. The girl throws a handful of pebbles. Sometimes I'm glad the glass is there. My visitors return. After the show, the spit pebble children come back. I display my impressive teeth. I splash my filthy pool. I grunt and hoot. I eat and eat and eat some more. The children pound their pathetic chests. They toss more pebbles. Slimy chimps, I mutter. I throw a meatball at them. Sometimes I wish the glass were not there. Sorry. I'm sorry I called those children slimy chimps. My mother would be ashamed of me. Julia, this is our last chapter for today. Like the spit pebble children, Julia is a child, but after... But that, after all, is not her fault. While her father, George, cleans the mall each night, Julia sits by my domain. She could sit anywhere she wants, by the carousel, in the empty food court, on the bleachers, coated with sawdust. But I'm not bragging when I say that she always chooses to sit with me. I think it's because we both love to draw. Sarah, Julia's mother, used to help her, used to help clean the mall. But when she got sick and grew pale and stooped, Sarah stopped coming. Every night, Julia offers to help George and every night he says firmly, homework, Julia, the floors are, will just get dirty again. Homework I have discovered involves a sharp pencil and thick books and long size. I enjoy chewing pencils. I'm sure I would excel at homework. Sometimes Julia dozes off and sometimes she reads her book, but mostly she draws pictures and talks about her day. I don't know why people talk to me, but they often do. Perhaps it's because they think I can't understand them, or perhaps it's because I can't talk back. Julia likes science and art. She doesn't like Lila Burpee, who teases her because, of, because her clothes are old. And she does like Deshaun Williams, who teases her too, but in a nice way. And she would like to be a famous artist when she grows up. Sometimes Julia draws me. I'm an elegant fellow in her pictures with my silver back gleaming like moon on moss. I will never look angry the way I do on the fading billboard by the highway. I always look a bit sad though. And then we're gonna stop here at Drawing Bob.